Welcome everybody to Introduction to Deep Learning. Um, this is the second lecture and in this lecture we're going to start with the machine learning basics. Um, if we are remembering very briefly from the previous lecture, we gave a very high level overview um, what this lecture content is going to be. And to be very precise, um, I wanted to give a differentiation between AI, ML and DL, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning and what the differences are. And this is exactly where we would like to continue today. Um, specifically, what we have discussed was that artificial intelligence was pretty much anything we can write up in a program, even if statement, you could in some way consider artificial intelligence. And machine learning is then the next, well, more sophisticated step where we have kind of a, a model that is being optimized and is learning based on some training data uh, in order to perform a certain task. And then finally, we're going to talk about deep learning, where we're going to have a neural network as our model that is then, well, supposedly more powerful than alternative machine learning methods. Okay, and this is exactly where we would like to continue today. Um, and before we step into these three categories again, I would now have the orthogonal thing when we're talking about tasks. So what I've just talked about was methods, right? What are learning methods? What is artificial intelligence methods, algorithms? And now we're going to talk about some tasks. So mainly we want to apply these kind of methods that we have in these categories here. We want to apply them, for instance, to computer vision. And we would like to start with a very, very simple task here. Um, and a simple task could be image classification, right? Um, this is the task we're going to deal with for quite a bit because it's it's very canonical and it's very very practical for computer vision applications. So what is it about? Well, it's relatively straightforward. So the task here is essentially given a set of input images. Um, what we would like to do is we would like to assign a class label for each of these images, right? So each of these cats here, we would like to uh, assign an orange box and each of the dogs here, we would like to assign a blue box. Um, and ideally, the way we would like to do this is we are, we are feeding this respective image that we want to look at and that we don't know the label yet. We would like to make a prediction based on a certain model that we're having, for instance, right? And this is the whole point of image classification, right? And the idea behind that is basically that we now, in a sense, having a mapping from the input, which is, for instance, a set of pixels, um, to some form of output label, right? So we have to translate, or we have to kind of find a mapping from a bunch of pixels of this image to which output label is going to be. And, well, you could you could imagine why this is becoming relatively complicated, um, because the diversity in natural images is actually quite complicated. Uh, to be a little bit more precise here, um, we see already that we have quite of a high diversity here. But even these images that you're seeing here, just for two simple classes, for dogs and cats here, uh, you see that they are also relatively straightforward, meaning that in each of these images, there is a unique label that can be associated to it, meaning that there's no mixture of, of like dogs and cats in the same image. So this is already a much more simplified task than if you're considering like real-world applications. Um, but even that simple task of image classification where it's a little bit easier, even that one is already pretty complicated and worth a look that we will devote quite a bit of time during this lecture today. Um, but why is that even so complicated? And um, it's actually very straightforward if you're looking at these images. So for instance, if you're taking these kind of images here, you see very briefly that we have a lot of occlusions, meaning that the problem that we're dealing with, practically speaking here, is that the real world around us is actually in three dimensions. Uh, but what the image is actually portraying and visualizing is just based on two dimensions, meaning we have kind of like, like the, the camera that took this image, took the 3D world and made it 2D. And in this projection, the, this is not a bijective mapping anymore, right? So we're losing some information from the 3D world and we're going to 2D. And because of that, we can have many, many 2D images for the same 3D objects underneath, right? Um, and this is a big problem, meaning that the resulting well, output here has things like occlusions, right? So not all the dog here is always visible, depending on from which camera angle the image was taken. Um, and each of these images, you can also see, they have some stuff in it. So this image has a little box in it, for instance, um, and, and so on. So, right? so these occlusions make it very difficult 
adding more complexity to the respective um, yeah, diversity of images. We can also see that the backgrounds can be vastly different, right? And this makes a big difference. We can have very extreme cases like these two here, right? So we can see here there's a white background with a white, deck and, uh, white dog in the foreground, um, and we have here a black cat during the night with a black background, right? So this is kind of an extreme example why image classification could become very tricky and why, especially for computers, it's very difficult to make distinctions or to assign correct class labels in these specific cases here. Um, and if you're just continuing this, what I've just talked about, for instance, you're going to, you know, just go on Google image search uh, and you're trying to find for, well, look for a bunch of cat images, you see kind of a large diversity um, in terms of images. Um, so you see very different poses. How is the cat looking? What is the current pose? Like this is one, this, this kitten is kind of like in this up pose here, right? Um, this cat here sitting down. Um, this cat is like to the side. So the cat itself can have a different pose. But also the camera, what I just mentioned is, because again, we go from this 3D world to the 2D image, can also have a different pose, right? The camera pose here, our camera parameters can vastly change. The camera in itself can also change, by the way, right? So we can go ahead um, and have, and can have different lenses. We can have different focal lengths, like simple outer focus or so might actually change quite a bit how the image is going to look like. Um, illumination can change. Um, that's very obvious, right? And illumination can be quite complicated, right? Day and night, we have just seen, um, but we can also have like vastly different environments, basically, where we see um, respectively different outputs. And then, of course, we have different appearances with very, very extreme cases where like the cat is kind of wrapped um, like a burrito. And in that case, of course, it's very difficult to do a proper representation. So if you're summarizing most of these things um, and um, a lot of people who have taken, for instance, computer graphics courses, they know basically the problem what we're dealing with here, right? So we're basically dealing with the 3D world. Um, we have a bunch of, in, in graphics, you would say scene parameters, right? You have poses where the camera is located. You're going to have light sources being distributed in a scene. You're going to apply some shading, like how, how do the respective materials reflect and so on. So all of the things that you feed in the graphics pipeline, they're going to tell you at the end of the day how an image is going to look like. And as I said, this is not a bijective mapping, meaning that there's many, many images that actually explain the same 3D underlying project, uh, object. And even what makes matters worse, even the 3D shapes within one class are even diverse too. So we have different 3D shapes, and each 3D shape can have different images associated to it. And that problem basically means that, well, this becomes a pretty difficult problem because for a bunch of like cats, we actually can have quite a large diversity of images. And this makes image classification such a challenging but also interesting problem that we would like to look at. One of the key things that we would also like to talk about in this lecture is what is the actual representation. And this is a really, really big question. Um, when I'm talking about classification, um, the representation for the most part we're going to use um, as input is going to be a set of pixels. It's a 2D array, right? We have RGB D values, maybe, probably not D, but most of the time we have RGB. Depth is not always given. Um, sometimes it's just grayscale, sometimes it's RGB. Um, so these are typically our input um, representations that we're given, for instance, um, when we're looking at a JPEG or a PNG file. Um, but then what we would like to do is we would like to create higher level of representations. And this is a thing we're going to talk a little about when, when we're going to talk about feature extraction. Uh, we would like to talk about representations that basically abstract all these things away what I've just talked about, right? A good representation would be that all of these different things here shouldn't matter for a good representation. So this raw representation of input pixels, we would ideally like to map to some high level representation where it's much easier to do classification. Um, and this is something that we're going to use neural networks for. Um, but unfortunately, there's still a few things we have to learn first. We have to look at a few things um, before we actually start with complicated feature learning. Um, instead, what we would like to do is we would like to start a little bit simpler. Um, in fact, we would like to start very, very simple. So the simplest possible way, or the simplest, let's say, algorithm, what we could deal with um, is a very simple classifier. And the way what we could do here is we could do simply nearest neighbor lookups. So what does that mean? Well, 
let's assume we're having a bunch of images. Uh, let's also assume um, for these images, we're going to have labels, so we know their respective classes, right? So for instance, we have these images here. Uh, for these images, we're having one, two, three, four, five, six cat images. We're going to label them with an orange box. This makes it clear that this is an orange box um, that refers to a cat. Uh, we're going to have two dogs here. They have blue boxes, um, which is referring to a dog. And now what we would like to do is we would consider these ones as our reference images. Um, reference images is, is, is maybe not the right term. The reason why I'm using it is later we're going to call them training images. But at the moment, there's no training. At the moment, all we would like to do is we would like to take these reference images here. Um, and what we would like to do is we would like to take a new image here. And for this new image, we would like to understand to which of these other images in our reference data set are we the closest, hence the nearest neighbor. So which of these other images is our nearest neighbor? Well, so how do we do that? Well, it comes a little bit back to the question what we've addressed before. What is the right representation? So in any kind of representation, we would love to compute a distance. In other words, what we would love to do is we would take this image and compare it against every other image here. Right. So let's just say we can do that. Let's just say we have this magic function right now in how to make that comparison. So we take this image, compare it, compute a value, to this image, that image, compare a value, and so on. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and sort all these images in our reference data set by these distances we just computed. Um, and we might end up getting something like this, right? So here we have our reference image. Uh, sorry, here we have our query image. Um, here we have all these reference images. And now we're going to have um, a distance function to each of these ones. We're going to get a distance value, um, and we sort this by distance. So these things here, this dog image is supposedly to be the closest, and these cat image here, they're supposed to be the furthest distant away from this query image that we have here, right? Um, and the idea behind this nearest neighbor classifier is after we have computed the distances and after we have sorted them by the distance, we simply assign the class level to the closest one. So in other words, well, okay, this one is presumably the closest one. Uh, and in this case, our nearest neighbor classifier would simply say, well, this is a dog, right? Um, and that's it. Now, um, you might imagine, of course, there's a couple of drawbacks. Uh, you might imagine it could be a large data set, there's a lot of compute involved, um, but it could also be pretty noisy. It might be accidentally that there's like one image of a cat that looks surprisingly similar, um, and we would like to be a little bit more robust. So instead of saying, oh, I'm going to try to be the closest to this one dog here, uh, or to this closest image, I'm going to say, I'm going to just take some sort of a median in a sense, right? I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to take the multiple nearest neighbors, and then to simply do a majority vote, which ones is the majority in the k nearest neighbors. So for instance, if we're saying we're setting this k, like this nearest neighbor classifier, to a three-way nearest neighbor classifier, so k nearest neighbors, where we set k to three, um, and we take the three closest images here, one, two, three, uh, and in this case, we would say it's a cat, actually, right? Because now we have two images here that are referring to a cat, and um, one image that refers to dog. So our majority vote here told us this is a cat. Of course, this is wrong, right? In this case, our, our k nearest neighbor classifier was not that great. Uh, but could, you can imagine how this basically changes, right? So you could imagine if we had a larger set of k's, we would get a little bit more robust to the respective data, right? Okay, um, what's kind of interesting is you can actually go ahead and take this classifier um, and plot it in 2D. So in other words, what we would love to do, uh, we would simply take our data, these are our, our reference images presumably right now, um, and now what we want to do is we want to assign, like we want to kind of extrapolate, we want to make sure that the entirety of this 2D area here is going to be filled with associated labels. So no matter where you are in this 2D space, you want to figure out what the respective nearest neighbors are. So if I'm here, I'm taking the nearest point, for instance this one, then I will assign a right here. So this, this point, Everything here is basically closest to this one, right? Everything here in this area is closest to this red point, and so on. So this is just literally coloring the areas based on which reference image was the closest. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. 
all you're doing is you're trying to find um, uh, the nearest neighbor point from where you are, and then you assign the respective class to where you are at the moment. Right. And this, of course, this changes now if you're going from a, a, a one nearest neighbor classifier to only taking the nearest one to a, a five-way nearest neighbor classifier. So from a five-way nearest neighbor classifier, uh, we are trying to figure out um, which one, like, whether it's a little bit more robust. So in this case, for instance, there's a green point here, right? You see this? Uh, so don't confuse my laser pointer with point, um, because I have a red laser pointer, but there's a green point here. Uh, and here we assign this one, this area here was the closest to this green point. And here, since we're saying we have a 5N nearest neighbor classifier, um, that means this, this green point here gets ignored, right? So this outlier gets, um, uh, gets ignored for the time being. Um, and if we have one outlier in our metric here, that means our nearest neighbor classifier gets slightly worse. Uh, not worse, but it's um, like here we're getting slightly better because we have 5n, we're ignoring it, and it's supposed to be an outlet. Okay, so let's have a bit of a discussion what the implications are between one nearest neighbor, five nearest neighbor, and so on. So let's have a couple of um, interesting questions. So the first interesting question is, well, I called this previously the reference data set. In practice, that's going to be our training data, right? Uh, in, in the end of the day, we want to train something on it. Um, so if we're performing a nearest neighbor classifier on the training data, how would this perform on the training data, right? So this is kind of a trick question, because if we're trying to find the closest image, and the current image that we're querying is actually in the training data, we would assume that the query image finds the perfect reference image, which finds itself right in the training set. And in this case, you would assume that a nearest neighbor classifier would perform perfectly, right? It would always find the right image, and it would, because it finds the right image, it would also assign the right class. Assuming, of course, our label is correct here, uh, we would make the correct classification. If you're taking a 5NN nearest neighbor classifier, that's not always the case, right? So these green points here, these green points would not perform perfectly because they would still be assigned to a red color, meaning that they would get the wrong label. And even though they are performed on the training set, they would not be perfect anymore. So you can already see that the nearest neighbor classifier and the 5NN classifier, they have slightly different behavior. And this is something we're going to later on pick up a little bit when we're talking about robustness in the context of neural networks. Like, for instance, how much do we want to regularize, how much do we want to smooth the labels, and stuff like that. This will become very relevant. Um, the second question you want to ask here is, which classifier is likely to perform best on the test data? Well, it depends, right? So the one argument for having a larger k here is we are a little bit better with respect to outliers. And with respect to outliers means um, we actually have a better coverage of the training samples and assuming our distribution is matching better between the training, these reference images that we had, and the respective query image. So in this case, we would probably assume that the, the 5 and n classifier would perform slightly better. But there's a caveat. I'm going to give you an extreme example. So if we are, for instance, setting our k equal to the total number of images in the training set, right? Um, what that would mean is we always going to take every image into account and just do a majority vote of all the images in our training set. And if that's the case, we're just going to always predict the same label, right? So that's not going to be very accurate. In fact, well, it's going to just predict the majority class. Um, and it's not a great example. So in this case, like if you're choosing, for instance, this k too large, that might also be a slab downside. So this is something also we have to consider. And later on, when we're doing neural network optimization, uh, we can also fall into similar pitfalls here, where we would accidentally just predict the majority class. So this is always a good a good sanity check. Whenever we're doing a classifier training, we want to do better than the majority class. It's not just the average, right? If you have more samples from one class, we would have to figure out to be better than this one class, at least, to, to do anything. Um, the next interesting question, like, what are we actually learning here? Right? Remember, we've talked about AI versus machine learning versus deep learning. So if you want to categorize our nearest neighbor classifier, um, well, so far, if you're thinking carefully, 
we haven't really done a lot of learning here, right? There's no like parameters that are trained based on some training data. And in fact, we, we more or less hard-coded our training set. So, okay, we do have a training set, right? Um, but we didn't train any network here, right? Um, or we didn't train any model in this case. And in practice, we just hard-coded our samples and we tried to assign it um, and hard-coded in our decision criteria. Right? So which one is closer? And based on that, we made a decision. So there's no actual learning in a sense going on. Right? Um, however, there's a few things we can actually play around with. Um, and these things are some hyperparameters. Um, and hyperparameters is a term, if you haven't heard it, um, that's a term that we're going to mention a lot. These are basically parameters that are not part of our model. In this case, we don't have a model, so there's no other parameters. Um, these are parameters that are choices for the algorithm itself. Right? So, for instance, in this case, hyperparameters is something like which distance function we're going to choose. So, the simplest distance function we could choose for our nearest neighbor classifier could be an L1 distance. Right? So, we're just going to take um, the pixel values, we're going to compare them one by one, and we're going to just compute an L1 distance between the RGB values, and that's going to give us the distance. Uh, we can also do the same thing with an L2 distance we can cho choose and decide depending on how we feel like and what we feel works better um, and to get different distance function and based on the different distance function you hopefully uh, can also change the outcome and the behavior of our respective classifier uh, we can also change the number of neighbors right so this k as we have noticed is quite um, quite important um, and and this is kind of the the typical higher parameters we would get in a nearest neighbor classifier. Now, these parameters, they are very problem dependent, right? So we don't know, right? Depends on what kind of classifier we, ha we have, what data set we have, uh, we would like to change these ones. And now you can already see, well, now there's a bit of a concept of learning coming into play, right? And by learning coming into play means, well, now we would like to look at our data set in this case, our training data set, or our, um, our reference data set, what I called it before, um, and would like to learn or adjust these parameters to a certain level. Um, so the big question is, how do we actually choose these hyperparameters, right? Um, and now machine learning comes into play, right? Now we want to move from a nearest neighbor classifier to using machine learning methods in order to learn these classifiers. Now, what we do here is, we would like to perform image classification, right? So in this case, we have our task. We've just defined that one. And when we're doing machine learning here, we would like to take a bunch of data experiences. We would like to take these ones. And we would like to learn from these ones to learn a model. And I'm trying to formalize this a little bit. So don't be too nitpicky here in the formulation. Um, this formulation will not be consistent with the rest of the lecture. But the high-level concept is always going to be the same for every machine learning um, for every machine learning problem. Um, again, this is a classifier right now, but the high-level concept of you having a, a, a certain model, you want to find parameters for that model, and for the input, you want to make a certain prediction. So I want to make clear what I mean by this. Okay, so here's our model. So this is our model M here. Uh, this model M here has a bunch of parameters. Um, it takes an image's input and it makes a class label prediction, right? Like, I'm not going to go into detail like how the class labels are being encoded right now or how the images are encoded. I wanted to go a step back, right, make this very high level just to get the high level con concept of machine learning. Uh, and if you know machine learning already, I'm sure this is really a good repetition because this is really a, a concept that is always going to be shared across many families of machine learning methods, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, so what we have is we have the model M, right? We have the model parameters theta, we have an input image I, and we have two output labels, class labels dog or cat. Note, I'm not having any hyperparameters here. This theta, these are the model parameters. This is very different from the hyperparameters. And we'll later see exactly what that means. But practically, as I said, the model parameters, they're being optimized on the training set. And the hyperparameters, this is a design choice on the algorithm itself how we do, for instance, optimization of these parameters, or how big our model is going to be. These are all hyperparameters. But now what we would love to do is, we would like to figure out, if we're taking a bunch of images, um, 
we would like to make sure that our model, in some sense, follows these predictions, what these images have been annotated with. So in other words, if I have a lot of images, um, and these images here, for instance, this image is a dog, if I'm feeding this image I here, um, this dog image, uh, then I would like this model here, when I feed this image in, I would like to make it a dog prediction. On the other hand, if I feed this cat image in, I would like to make it a cat prediction. And now the whole point of machine learning is that we're starting with a data set like this one. And now what we're doing is we're taking a part of these images, um, and I've already mentioned it a couple of times because I'm so used to it. Um, so these images, this part of these images, we're going to call the train set. So we're going to take, given these I images with train labels, so these are the images we're going to start some training. Um, and we would like to do is, we would like to make sure that our model makes these predictions that is in the train set. And then what we're hoping is, assuming we have, we have figured out our model based on these images, that our model also makes correct predictions on previously unseen images. So if I'm training on these ones, I hope that the model makes also good predictions on these ones, ideally perfect predictions. Right. So this is our training uh, a train set here, and this is something we're going to call the validation set afterwards. And the way this is going to go is, when I say training, for the most part, and again, don't go too much into, <laughs> into my notation here, I just wanted to make this very, very dead simple here. Um, what we're going to do is, we're going to find these parameters theta. And in this case, what we do here is, we optimizing for a theta such that, um, our model here, if we're summing over all of our training images, minimize the distance between the labels and what the model predicts. So model predictions and ground truth labels, these are the ground truth labels, cat, dog, and dog. Uh, these ones should match, right? So if I feed in an image I, I want to make the label prediction of this image I. Um, now there's a lot of things here that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug. Course, right? So, for instance, there's a distance function. There's a lot of different ways how to define these distance functions. We're going to talk about a couple of these ones today, um, and presumably going to talk about a couple of more in the in the next lectures as well. Um, another question is how are these labels even defined? Are these literally numbers like zero and one? Right? There could be also a couple of different ways how to define those numbers. And then how is the image I defined? I mean, pixels is the obvious one, but could be also other things, right? Um, but the high-level concept between machine learning is always going to be the same. It's always very similar, right? So what you're doing is you're having some form of a, uh, of a training set. You're taking these labels here uh, in, in the ground truth labels, um, and you're trying to make sure the model predicts whatever the ground truth labels are. Right? This is what you want to do. And then what I just mentioned a couple of times, I mentioned this concept of training. Well, this is also, when I'm mentioning training, for the most part, what I mean is, I mean, run your favorite optimization to find the optimal parameters theta prime such that this model best fits this training set, right? This is what we want to do. We would like to make sure that our model fits the training set, explains the labels in the training set. And once we've trained that model, meaning we have tried to find an optimal solution based on the training set, so such this model approximates the distribution of these labels here, we hope that our model eventually generalizes. And generalization means now if I feed in unseen images, that we also make new reasonable predictions. Okay. Um, now I mentioned a lot of terms here, right? I mentioned the concept of a training set. I mentioned the concept of training versus optimization. I mentioned hyperparameters and model parameters. And I mentioned this concept of generalization, right? When we like going from a training set where we're using these ones as constraints and the optimization to train our model um, versus predicting and channelizing to unseen observations or to unseen samples, you know, right? Okay, so if you're trying to go and make this even more abstract, the basic concept of machine learning um, follows, is, is mainly data-driven. So most well, pretty much all machine learning methods that come to mind, they all in some way data driven. So when I'm going to talk about machine learning, I always mean there's some data and based on this data, you're going to train a model and based on this model, you're going to make predictions on things that you haven't seen before. Okay. 
So what we do first is whenever we're developing an algorithm, and um, what we what we do have in computer vision is, for instance, an image data set, right? Like ImageNet is a, is, a, is a great example that's widely used. So what we do is we're splitting our data. We're having a train data set, we're having a validation data set, and a test data set. And what we do here is uh, we say, for instance, we have a split like 60, 20, 20 percent, right? So this is 100 percent of our data. We're splitting it up in order to develop our algorithm. And what we would love to do here is we would like to take our training set. Uh, basically, all in the past, what I've told you in the previous slides, is mostly start of the training set. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to find model parameters theta based on the training. Um, what does it mean finding model parameters? Well, model parameters means we're running an optimization. The training samples are giving us constraints for this optimization. And we, we're basically running this, this optimization here, right? So based on our distance function, we're trying to find optimal theta prime parameters that give us good answers. Now, if you're going further, now we have our validation set. You might ask, well, why on earth do we need a validation and a test set? Can I just train these model parameters and go make some predictions on having some accuracy or so on my classifier, and I'm going to be done? Um, you could do that. However, the problem is, assuming you're running your training set, you're having a bunch of model parameters theta, um, you want to evaluate how well your model is doing. So now I'm going to go ahead and going to evaluate my model, how well it's doing, and I'm realizing, yeah, okay, it's not that great. I would like to change a few things. So for instance, if I go back quickly, I would like to change this distance function d. I would like to change the different one. Um, if you did this, this would mean you're changing a hyperparameter here, um, and you're training again, and then you're getting a different result. right? So you might assume, well, okay, I'm getting different results when I change some of these hyperparameters. That's kind of logical. Um, but now you have to reevaluate again. right? And in this case, when you're reevaluating again, you're going to get different results. So the important thing right now is basically when you are finding hyperparameters, you want to use the validation set, meaning that you can do this multiple times and you can go ahead and train, evaluate, change a bunch of parameters, train again, evaluate again, and so on. So you can do this pretty much as much as you want. Um, and in practice, you would do this as much as you want because um, this is quite important because you're going to realize some, some of your models might have certain weaknesses. Some of your loss functions might not be ideal. Some, some of your um, regularizers, we'll talk about this also later, what that means. Some of your optimization parameters might have been not ideal. And you might have to change certain things. And if you did this, that would mean um, you're looking actually at the results. So in other words, as soon as you're doing that, you're not looking at the real data anymore. Because as soon as you're considering the validation samples, you're actually taking those ones as part of your model development as your model training process. And because of that, we now need a separate test set that is actually different from the validation set. And the key critical part here is, once we found our right hyperparameters, once we're happy with our model choices, once we're happy with how the model trains and how it evaluates on the validation set, only then we can go ahead and test on the test set. And this is really important and a lot of people get it wrong, even in the research community. Um, the important thing is that you only test once. Right? So as soon as you go ahead and test multiple times, in a sense, you're cheating. Why are you cheating? Because now you're taking test information from samples where you would like to understand how well your model generalizes to. You're using now information how to train your model. And this is really critical. And I can give you a couple of examples how this could actually work in practice. So in the research community, typically what happens, there's data sets available, computer vision, right? Um, and these data sets, they're going to give you certain results. So now the problem is, of course, um, if you want to objectively evaluate, um, you want to make sure that you, know, you have a test set that people don't use over and over again. Because if people always use their test sets and they're trying so many times while developing the algorithm and trying all the time on the test set, eventually they're just doing whatever is in the test set, right? Um, and they will find parameters that give the best test performance. But that's cheating. They shouldn't have used the test set for that purpose. In fact, they should have used the validation set and then try to see how well it generalizes to unseen samples they did not consider doing the method development. And in practice, what people do then in computer vision often is they have benchmarks and benchmark often means that people give out, for instance, test images 
and then people have to run the algorithms on the test images and then they upload their results to an evaluation server. But the catch is the test image labels are not given to the respective users. So they don't know what they're doing basically. So they're only going to get once a result back from the test image. Now, you could imagine that people are trying to get around this. Uh, people try to make multiple accounts on these benchmark servers and stuff like this. But now you can guess, well, this is, a, this is suddenly a point of cheating where you basically um, not reflecting the channelization to real data anymore. So this is a very, very important concept. Okay, so bottom line here is use training to optimize the model parameters, use the validation to find the hyperparameters, iterate as many times as you want, and until you're happy with that, then you test at the very end of the day, you test on the test set. Now, if you're going back to our task, how can we learn now to perform image classification? Well, we have two things right now. We have a task, we have image classification, we have experience, that's our training and validation data. And now what we do is we have some performance measure that is giving us some accuracy. Um, and this is typically what we evaluate at the end of the day of the test set. And then we have um, a metric that tells us how well does our method actually work in practice. All right. So this is the very high level concept of machine learning. Um, and now, if you're asking, well, why are there so many different machine learning methods? Well, the question is always, how does this model look like? And how do we optimize it and fit it to the respective training data? How do we make it channelized very well? And the reason why we're having this lecture, and the reason why it enjoys a lot of popularity right now, is that the networks, neural networks, they perform very well as these models. And we can show later on that they're great at channelization for many, many, many tasks. Okay. So before we getting actually into simple machine learning uh, models, um, I would like to have a few things that I would like to clarify. So what I've just described as machine learning, for the most part, was supervised machine learning. Um, however, I would also like to, to, to acknowledge and I would like to say, well, there's also unsupervised machine learning. Um, and I would like to make a, a quick um, differentiation between those because a lot of people, of course, have heard about these, these two terminologies and it's very important to distinguish between those. So when we are talking about supervised learning, we always mean we have some labels given, target classes, some regression targets, and so on. And what we'd like to do is we have a training set here, we have these labels, for instance, here, and we would like to train a model based on the data such that ideally it matches the distribution and then generalizes to an unseen set of samples at the end of the day. Now, here's the challenge. Um, for the most part of this course, we're going to deal with supervised learning. Um, there's going to be a few exceptions where we deal with unsupervised learning. For the most part, I would say 90 plus percent of this course, we're going to deal with supervised learning. And when I'm going to talk about machine learning, in the context of this course, for the most part, I'm going to refer to supervised learning. But this is, of course, not true. There's unsupervised learning. There's also things like self-supervised learning and so on. Um, I wanted to give you a few examples here. So unsupervised learning is basically when you don't have class labels, when you don't have any labels, basically. Um, and the idea of unsupervised learning is, for the most part, some form of uh, clustering of the structure. right? So you're trying to figure out, essentially, so let's say you have the data, um, and you're trying to divide your samples into clusters and then you assign a class label to each cluster. So this class label doesn't necessarily have a semantic meaning, but it like it just assigns a cluster to, a class label to it. And based on the class label, you can then finally, um, well, make some use of it in, in, in one way or another one. And in that case, what we would do is to say, okay, here we have, for instance, our example of our cats and dogs again. Let's say we can cluster those ones into two classes unsupervised learning here would say, well, okay, you have these two classes, you assign them labels, but technically speaking, you don't know any semantic labels yet, unless somebody goes manually and assigns uh, cluster labels, uh, what we've gotten out of it. There's also a lot of unsupervised learning in the context of deep learning. It does exist, and we will talk a little bit about it, but for the most part, the focus of this class will not necessarily, um, or this course will not necessarily be an unsupervised learning. Um, there's also a very fun discussion of what is the more natural thing, like unsupervised learning versus supervised learning. Um, 
it's very philosophical and like researchers in the last decades have gone back and forth. Um, there's a fun argument, a very philosophical one, is have humans, do we learn supervised or do we learn unsupervised? And the fun argument is, well, at the beginning when there was no life on Earth, eventually, like humanity, life in general, had to start learning somehow, right? And then basically the argument is everything can be learned in an unsupervised fashion. And then the counter argument is that is, well, if you have some, if you don't um, listen to a language, for instance, as a child, uh, you're not being able to speak very well. And you can only do this very well when somebody corrects you, when somebody tells you certain things. And a lot of the things your parents do with you and a kid is actually quite supervised. And I found this very interesting. So I'm obviously, I'm no, uh, um, I don't understand the biology behind how the human brain works here. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting, the debate versus like how much supervision do we actually need for learning? It's a very fun, fun question to ask when we're talking about um, modern machine learning techniques specifically in the context of representation learning, a lot of people say, well, you have a large number of labels, uh, so a large number of training samples on the internet, for instance, where you don't have labels, but can you still use the data and then combine it um, later on with some fine tuning um, where you do actually have labels. So this is kind of interesting, a lot of cool stuff. But again, caveat here for the introduction to deep learning here, we, we are mostly talking about supervised learning. I also wanted to mention that there's uh, reinforcement learning that's, I guess, kind of in between here. Um, reinforcement learning has kind of this interesting concept of agents and environment, right? So agents interact with an environment and based on their performance, they're going to get some reward. Um, and depending on how this reward goes, your agent is going to adapt uh, and hopefully learn something, right? So for instance, in, in games, um, well, board games or even video games, for instance, um, reinforcement learning is very popular and robotics reinforcement learning is very popular where you basically have only a final reward. Uh, and based on that final reward, um, your model can learn something and can, for instance, um, learn certain policies, like, I don't know, playing chess or learning how to play a video game, um, which is kind of cool uh, that you can do this in a kind of, well, unsupervised um, fashion. Uh, but I would say this is still a little bit in between because you still need to define how the reward works. And you still need to define basically when you're winning, when you're losing, possibly how much you're winning, how much you're losing. So it's kind of an interesting question um, how to associate reinforcement learning. Okay, but let's go back to supervised learning. Um, I mentioned this is what we would love to talk about for the most part here. Um, and now, if we're going back a few slides mentally, um, we remember that the whole point of supervised learning was we have our training set and we would like to figure out a model that we fit to this training set, right? So again, we have our model M, for instance, we would like to find parameters theta such that our model approximates or mimics the distribution of the training set. Now, the big question is, what model do we actually use? Well, let's start with a simple linear model, for instance, right? Um, and that's the easiest way of a model we could, we could think about. So this is a linear decision boundary that we would like to figure out. Um, so the idea here is we would like to fit a hyperplane um, that splits our samples in part here for a classifier. For regression, it's a little bit different. We want to can do a little bit other stuff. Uh, but if you had a classifier, we would like to have a hyperplane and we'd like to split these two things apart. Um, and this is what we're going to do right now. So all we're going to do in the next few slides is we're trying to find parameters for this hyperplane um, that figures out how to approximate our training set to the best of our abilities. And you can already see why I'm, mentioned, why I'm, why I'm saying approximate. Um, I'm saying this for a very specific reason. Because you can clearly see the con here of a linear model here is that it cannot possibly um, fit all data samples, right? So if you had one of these triangles, if you had one of them here, there would be no hyperplane possible anymore to fit in here, such that it perfectly explains the training set. And that would be a problem. So, why am I starting with it? And that's basically the pro. The pro is, well, it's really simple to understand how basic machine learning works. And it's probably the simplest model we can begin with. Um, but it also has certain advantages in practice. It's actually relatively easy to deploy. It doesn't overfit that much. It can, right? It doesn't have so many degrees of freedom. Um, and it's actually a very nice way to get into it. So let's start with it. Um, so now instead of starting with a 
classifier, I would like to change the problem statement a little bit. Um, in this case, we want to start with regression. And instead of the classifier, the difference here is when I talk about regression is simply you, you instead of predicting a, a discrete label, we're now predicting a continuous floating point output, for instance. Um, and the idea of supervised learning now is, well, we would like to find a linear model that explains a target y given the inputs x. Well, okay. So what do we have here? Well, we're going to start with our training data. Um, these points here, they are now our training data. So these red points, right, they have, they have an x value, they have a y value. So the x values are the inputs, and the y values are our targets or our outputs, right? So that, that's what we would like to approximate. We would like to make sure that this distribution that is given right now for these given inputs, we would like to make sure that if we give for instance, this input feature here, um, I guess I shouldn't call it a feature yet, I should call it first like a value here. For this value here, we would like to make the y value here as a prediction. And the way what linear regression is doing, it's essentially fitting this, this little line here, right? Um, and this fitting this line, and I'm mentioning this all the time, fitting means we're just literally formulating an optimization function here, um, is we're optimizing the parameters of this line. This will become a higher plane, obviously, later when we go to high, higher dimensions, but for, for 2D, this is just a simple line. Okay, uh, so what does training mean? Well, training means we have a bunch of data points given. So data points are these, these yellow or orange points here, right? Um, these orange points, um, they are pairs. They have an input and a target. So they have x is the respective like feature. This is the input. Um, this is the measurement, could be an image. And y is the respective target label, right? So input image, measurement, whatsoever. And y is our respective labels, like cat dog in the classification case or in the regression case, we'll see later a few other examples. Could be could be discrete, right? It could be also continuous. By the way, if you're going quickly back here, um, at the moment between regression and classification, there's practically no difference. We'll later see what the differences are. Um, but the reason for the simplicity right now, let's just assume these labels are continuous. Um, so if they're classifier, we just say, oh, these labels are between zero and one, right? And we're going to make sure um, that everything between 0.5, then it's label 1, everything under 0.5 is going to be label 0, right? But it could, it could be a continuous label too, right? Okay, um, so we have input measures, we have labels, and what we would like to do is we would like to learn um, the model parameters theta um, to make the correct estimation. And what does correct estimation mean? Well, um, we would like to have make sure that y hat is, is if I feed in a new xn plus 1 here, we, we get a, a correct estimation y hat. Uh, and you can see what's very important here is, so this notation is important. We're going to use this a bit. So x is always the input. y is always the target. So this is our ground truth target. Um, y hat is always going to be our predicted estimation. This is what the model predicts. Um, x n plus 1, you see n plus 1 here is one uh, is one index more than what we have in the training set. This is a test sample here. So we're feeding this in here in our, in our model. Uh, theta is our model parameters. And based on theta, we're having a predictor that makes this, this prediction here, right? Um, and the whole point is that we want to find these parameters theta. Um, again, to clarify, this can be the parameters of a neural network. This concept here does not change right now. Like the only point right now is going to be whether this data is part of a linear or nonlinear larger model. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, we're not quite a neural network yet. We're going to make this a little bit easier. This data here is now simply a linear model. And linear model means it's, it's linear. <laughs> That's the definition. So what we do here, here right now is um, we're taking the, um, the input here. So x here is the input and we're multiplying with theta. So imagine this little example that we had here. I'm going to go quickly back. In this case, if x is just a single floating point value and it's just one scalar, then this here, um, this d here, this is the input dimension, would be 1. So we would just have a single theta multiplied with x. That's it. And we're predicting y. And then we're finding um, whatever our respective output is going to be approximated best. Now, in practice, 
This is a little bit more complicated. This is the features. This is why I mentioned this already. X is not just a single scalar. X could actually be a vector, right? There could be many, many, many inputs. Um, an image is a very large feature, for instance, right? An image could be like a megapixel, a million pixels, right? Could be a lot of, could be a lot of inputs. Um, so, and D here is our dimension. So, oh, I'm not here yet, sorry. These are the weights then. These are the model parameters, the theta here. Uh, and D is our input dimension, right? And again, think about the example what I just mentioned before. Um, in this example, uh, if I only have a single dimension here as input, I just have an x here, um, and I want to fit a plane to it. <coughs> oh, in one D, actually, I want to just fit in this line. Now, I'm cheating a little bit here. This is technically a little bit wrong for my formulation. If you go into the 1D case, you will quickly notice this. You also need a bias here. So you need, um, you need a theta zero. Um, why do you need that? Well, technically you don't need it, but I think it, it makes the fitting a little bit easier. So technically you need um, where the uh, line here intersects with the y-axis, right? Um, and this one is important because otherwise you cannot define arbitrary lines. Otherwise they would only go uh, through zero, zero and you would just literally define the slope here, right? But we have the slope and we have, um, uh, we have basically where uh, the line intersects with the y-axis here. Okay, and, but then the rest is the same, right? So we have here the bias plus the formula we just had, right? We just say we multiply x, i, j with theta j, right? Input feature dimension plus with the current sample. Um, and then we just multiply this out, and this is essentially what we're getting from our sum here, right? Okay. Um, I think let's have an example, right? This is actually relatively easy, so this shouldn't be something new to you from a mathematical perspective. So all we're trying to have is we have a certain set of constraints. Our constraints are given by our data points, these orange points here. Um, and what we would like to do is, we would like to make sure that the thetas are optimized such that these points here are approximated in the best possible way. Best possible way is also something we'll define in a second because that's depending on our loss function. Okay, let's make a linear prediction here. Let's predict the temperature of a room. Let's assume we want to make sure. Um, I'm going to give you a bunch of information and I would like to ask you what is the temperature of a building? Well, what information could I give you? And this is the features that I'm giving you right now. So I'm going to give you four different type of features here. I'm going to tell you how warm it is outside. I'm going to tell you the level of humidity. I'm going to tell you the number of people in the building. And I'm going to tell you the sun exposure to the building. Right? Okay. And now what I would like to do is I would like to, I would like to ask you, based on these inputs that you have, what is the most likely temperature of the inside of the building? So Give me a model that does that. Um, and in order to do that, what I'm, what, I'm asked, what I'm giving you also is I'm going to give you a bunch of supervision. So I'm going to give you a bunch of ground truth pairs for training where I pair these four dimensional input features here with our respective prediction. Right? Okay, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so this is a trick question now. How many parameters do we need to fit that? Well, we're taking this formula that we had before. Each of these features is associated with one theta. Right? So all we're doing right now is we're just re how do each of these features contribute to the input or to, to the output temperature of the building. Right? Um, and we have a bias, of course, so we have one more. Um, so we have these. Um, and now what we can do is we can write this down as a matrix form. Right? Uh, so now what we do is we just have um, here we're going to have the respective prediction of our model. Here we're going to have the respective thetas. And here, we're going to have the respective um, input features that we have. So this D here, in our case, this one was 4, right? Um, so this one went from 1 to 4. Um, and this N here is how many measures we have. Like the number of rows in this equation tells us how many samples we have. And the number of, sorry, the number of columns tells us um, how many features we have and the number of rows um, tells us how many samples we have, right? Okay, and the idea is that if we now, we can pull this, this bias actually in here, right? So we're just having, we're just 
combining this matrix here. So we're just adding um, another column with ones here. So we're adding the theta zero here now. Uh, and we can just simply write this in a matrix form. So now what we know is y hat is equal to x times theta. And now it's important what we have here. y is a vector, x is a matrix, and theta is also a vector. Theta is, in fact, our unknown vector, which is the most important thing we want to figure out this one right now. Um, well, that's what we'd like to figure out. Okay. Um, so this is a linear equation system, right? Um, what you would know from, from um, analysis and linear algebra. Um, so linear algebra tells you that depending on how many unknowns you have, you need a certain number of equations, right? So what might happen here is your equations might, so your system here might be overdetermined, underdetermined, or fully determined, right? So if the, th the thetas and the number of samples are the same, then this is going to be a, a the, this here is going to be a square matrix, right? Um, sorry, this here is also this here is going to be a square matrix too, of course. Then, um, and then we can can have a unique solution where we have the best fit possible. If we have more of them, well, then we have to find a different way. Or if we have fewer of them, we also have to find a different way. And a little spoiler: what we're practically going to do is we're going to do a least square fit. Um, okay, so let's make this more concrete again. I want to I want to make sure that everybody gets this because this is very fundamental for what we're going to do with the neural networks because neural networks are not so far away from this what we're doing here right now. So in fact, this here we have the predictions of our model. So the y hat one to y hat n. Uh, we're gonna have the model parameters which we have here, theta zero to theta d. This is the dimension here. Um, we also know. Um, the input feature dimensionality, right? Obviously, the input feature dimensionality plus one needs to match with the number of um, parameters in our model. Otherwise, this like uh, row times column multiplication doesn't work anymore. Um, and yeah, and then what we need to know now is, well, we have these input features. One sample here has d features or d dimensional feature. I mean, you could call the whole thing one feature as well, and it's a feature vector then. Um, and then we have our model respectively. Okay, so let's make it more concrete in our example. So our example was our temperature in the building. So what do we have here? We have the, the this one was the bias at the beginning. Um, we have the outside temperature, we have humidity, number of people, and sun exposure and percent. Right? Um, so now what we want to do is we want to figure out how can we train our model? Well, our model right now has one, two, three, four, five parameters. So four of these parameters are directly associated with the respective input features. And one of them is the bias. So if, for instance, one of these entries here is zero, that means this input feature will be ignored, right? If there's a zero, then this feature will not contribute to the output predictions. Um, if this one has a very high value, then this feature will contribute a lot. And what's also interesting is, assuming, for instance, the sun exposure here is in percent, assuming I didn't write the percentage in integers and I would divide it by 100, well, ideally our model would figure out um, that you just have to divide the model parameters here also by 100, right? So otherwise you would actually change the result. So in principle, the scaling and stuff like this should factor out because if you multiply this one, you should just divide this one respectively, right? And so on. Okay, but it is very straightforward, right? So we have here our, uh, our, our, our made up samples that we have. So we have two samples here that we are making up. Uh, these are our made up things. Um, if we're having two samples, we uh, know already that we are under constraint, right? So we have two predictions for these two samples, um, but we have our model. So if we have the model already, what can we do here is for this model, we can make certain predictions so if we have these input features and these input features, our model will make certain predictions here, right? So if you're running this through the model, this one would mean, oh, this one uh, is great, this is warm, and this one would mean, oh, no, it's cold. Uh, I didn't do the multiplication here, but I assume this is a larger number, and this one I assume is a smaller number. Okay, um, but now the big question is, so this is assuming we have these model parameters here. But now the question in the learning process is, how do we actually obtain these model parameters? And I mentioned it a couple of times. This leads to a, a, 
uh, linearly squares optimization. So we have to figure out how can we find these parameters, how can we solve these equation systems. Okay, how do we do it? Well, we have the data points x here. Uh, these data points x, they give, you, give us our model parameters. So they're being fed into the model parameters. Based on these ones, we're making a, an estimation. Um, we have here our ground truth. We're defining a loss function here. And based on that loss function, we're updating the model parameters again, right? And then, then we, we optimize, right? Um, and that's what we're going to do. Data points is input, model parameters, estimation, loss function, how wrong are we? And then we optimize. Back. Okay, so what are the two important things here? We have introduced two, two important concepts here. So the concept here is we have the loss function that measures how good is my estimate and tell the optimization how to make it better, right? So how good is my model and how do I make it better? Like, what does how to make it better mean? Well, the idea for the loss function is it should get smaller when the model gets better, right? If the loss function is high or if the loss is high, um, then we know our model is not that great and we have to change something. So if I change something, my loss goes down, then I'm like, Yay, I'm doing great. And the optimization, it changed the model in order to improve the loss function, right? So I want to improve the estimations based on my training samples that I have available. And again, this concept here is the same across all of machine learning pretty much. Okay, maybe there are certain things that do slightly differently, but this high-level concept is we have a loss function, we want to minimize it, we want to optimize it, and based on the optimization, we want to change the model in order to improve the loss function. So how do we do this in the context of the linear regression? Well, again, I'm reiterating here, we have to solve our linear uh, least square system. So we have this prediction of the temperature in the building. Um, and this optimization process pretty much goes like that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this line here. I'm going to check my distance. I'm going to see, huh, all right, this gives me a certain value. Uh, now I have another value that is up there. And if the value is up there and tells me, oh no, there's a high loss here, I have to change my line. Right? So I have to update, I have to update this line such that the overall average loss actually goes down. This is what this loss function is going to do. Right? And I'm trying to use an average and treating all samples equally right now. We'll later talk about what we do with these outliers because that's obviously a bad case, but this is what we would like to address. Okay. Um, well, what we do. Okay, so we mentioned we have to solve our famous linear least squares problem. So, right, so what we do is we just take an L2 loss, um, we compare our predictions with the respective crown truth samples, um, and we're trying to minimize that, that, that function here, right? So that's all that we're going to do. So also what you'll see, a lot of people will call this function very differently. Some people call it objective, objective function, energy, cost function, and so on, all the same stuff, right? Just depending on who you're gonna ask, if it's a math guy, a machine learning guy, and so on. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we have to optimize for that. Um, and now we have to minimize that function. So minimization here means minimize this function here in order to fit the linear model to the respective data points. That's what we care about right now, right? Okay, this is actually a convex problem meaning that there is actually a closed form solution, solution that is unique. Um, and of course, linear algebra tells you exactly how to do that. Um, and if you're doing this, the way this is, is done is we're doing this over all the training samples. So we have n training samples here. So we do taking the average, so we're dividing by n here. Um, and the important thing right now here is that this y hat, we have to express actually with our respective model, right? So our respective model, like you might be surprised, so why on earth, what is he talking about? Like there's a theta here, um, but there's no theta here anymore, okay? Um, so this y hat is nothing else but xi times theta. Uh, this is the estimation from the linear model. This is the linear model, what it's doing. Uh, and note that this is extra matrix uh, notation here, right, already, right? So this one here is going over the training samples, but this one here is one feature vector times our vector of weights. Right? This is a, a, a vector, this is a dot product here, right? Um, and this dot product, because there's another sum here, we can now go ahead and write write the whole thing as a matrix notation, right? So we can write this square thing as the matrix notation. Um, in this case, we know this one is now a matrix. This is n training samples, 
each has an input vector of, of d, and this x here is written as a matrix, basically. All right. So these are our training samples here and here. Um, and of course, I'm assuming you know also this function. This is nothing else but the normal equation. It's the same thing. Um, and we also know that this y here is our n labels that we care about, right? So these ones we want to approximate. This is a matrix, this is a vector, and this is also a vector. Right? Um, we will talk a little bit about the matrix notation in the exercise session. Um, we understand that a lot of people taking this lecture um, well, let's put it this way. The linear algebra course might have been a few semesters ago, and we're happy to give a bit of a refresher course here. So you want to keep this course relatively easy to follow. So we are actually giving you um, a bit of an intro on the matrix notation. So if you were a bit struggling here, I would recommend maybe pause the video here and actually go and, and check our, our tutorial on the matrix notation first. Um, however, at the same time, for the rest of the sake of the video, I'm assuming that you know, or at least have a basic knowledge of matrix notations. Okay. All right. So what does it mean? Well, this is obviously a convex function. Um, this is the normal equation, right? Um, we know that from linear algebra. Um, and we know that there's an optimum, and we know how to find that optimum. And the way how we do find that optimum is very straightforward. Um, actually, we have learned this already in high school. In high school, we know if we have a quadratic function like this one, this is a quadratic function, it's the normal equation. Um, then we know that the gradient, um, when the gradient is zero here, we know then we have found a minimum or a maximum, depending on what shape the function is, right? Um, but we have an extrema uh, when the gradient is going to be zero. Uh, so how do we optimize that? Well, um, it's also relatively straightforward. Uh, we just compute the gradient of this matrix form, right? And if we're taking the gradient with respect to the thetas, that's what we care about. These are our parameters we would like to solve for. Uh, we end up with 2 times x transposed times x times theta minus 2 times x transposed times y, and this should be equal to 0, right? This is all constraint here. So we're saying, please find me the gradient, uh, uh, find me a point where the gradient is 0. That's what we're setting here. And the way we're finding that is it's xt times x inverse times xty, right? And again, you will notice this very... Rightfully, this is this is the normal equation, right? Like if you if you bring this one here to the other side, then you have x t times x times theta is equal to x t times y, which is our residual. This is nothing else but a linear system to solve. Right? Um, there's a lot of lot of things. Um, I would love to give maybe a bit of more intro on linear algebra. Um, this is a thing that I I unfortunately still experience even at the PhD level that people often struggling is how to solve systems like these ones, right? Um, this is something that is very important, like how do you even invert a matrix like this, right? So in practice, for instance, you would never invert a matrix like this. You would always use a linear solo library, especially when the matrix becomes large. Um, there will be details in the exercise session. So again, please log into this when, you have, when you're struggling with that. I know there's a bit of redundancy. That's why I moved a little bit of stuff out here um, to the exercise sessions. And I hope that you can catch up with the things you might have forgotten about linear algebra. Okay, um, but assuming we can do that, right, we have found an analytical solution to a complex problem. Um, what do we do here again? Well, the inputs here are our features, like outside temperature, number of people, humidity, um, and so on. And this here on the right-hand side is our true output. It's the temperature of the building. And this is a least squares estimate, right? Um, so there's the, this is not necessarily the best estimate, but this is the simplest estimate. This is why we started with this one. Um, and there's a couple of different estimators here we're going to go through. Um, and each estimator has different properties, right? So for instance, one thing what we have seen here, if you're taking a square term here, you will see that if we're having one outlier, in this least squared estimate, we will unfortunately have a bit of a problem because if we have one outlier, then unfortunately, um, yeah, we might not be very robust to these outliers. So for instance, if you're taking an L1 loss here instead of an L2 loss, um, then we might be a little bit more robust to outliers. Unfortunately, the optimization becomes a little bit more tricky, right? So again, also, I hope that most people know that I'm still gonna repeat it a couple of times, right? If you're having an L2 loss here, it's a least squares estimate, the optimum will always be the mean. And if you have one outlier, the mean will shift quite a bit. 
if you have uh, an L1 loss, for instance, here, the optimum here will be the median. And then if you have one outlier, that will not affect the result that much. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit more. So this is basically an estimate we have done uh, based on an Anali square estimate. Now what I would like to do is I would like to talk about this from a probabilistic standpoint. And, and this is a thing called maximum likelihood. So it's very much related. Um, and we want to show why it's related um, to our linear regression that we have just seen. So maximum likelihood is also a concept that you might have heard in your stochastic lectures already. Um, but the core idea here is very specific to machine learning, meaning that what we would love to do is we would love to, love to look at some data. Um, and this data has an, a certain distribution. right? So it might be a sequence of numbers. It might be bunch of images, might be language, right? There's a true distribution, right? Um, so given the samples, this is basically our true distribution here. This is our data, what we have, right? Uh, so we have here our, uh, what is our respective value conditioned on the respective input, right? That's what we care about. This is what our, what's in our data. That's our true distribution that we want to care about. Um, and then what we have is we have our model. Now, our model, we would like to mimic our data to some degree. And I'm going to talk about what this means by mimic it. Um, so let's assume our model here is a par parametric family of distributions, right? So well, how is it parameterized? Well, this is these, these data parameters. That's what we've been talking about all the time right now, right? So these data parameters, they are model parameters. What we would like to do is that these data parameters make sure that our model right now here um, approximates basically our respective distribution. And what a maximum likelihood estimate is now saying is it's a method of estimating the parameters of a statistical model given the distributions. Uh, sorry, given the observations. So what we have, we have here our model, which we just defined. What we care about is the theta. These are our model parameters. Um, and now we have a bunch of observations from our data, right? And what we would like to do now is we would like to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood of making the observations given the parameters, right? So in other words, we want to make sure that the model predicts what our observations say, right? That's basically what it says. So we would like to make sure that we're finding um, these parameters and in a mathematical sense, what that means is we would like to make sure we maximize the likelihood. That's why it's called maximize likelihood. The, the model matches whatever the true observations are going to say. And since we're assuming right now this is a stochastic process, this is why it's an estimate and it's a likelihood estimate. OK. Um, now, there's a couple of assumptions what we're making here. Um, and there's basically two, two main assumptions. Um, so what we are assuming is that the maximum likelihood estimate assumes that the training samples are independent and they're generated all by the same probability distribution. We'll later talk about which distribution it is, but they're independent and they're from the same distribution. And that's important. This is our assumption what we're making with our maximum likelihood estimate. And assuming we say these are independent, and this is very important now because assuming they're independent for the sampling strategy, this means all we have to do is we check our model. We make a prediction here basically every time. Uh, that means we can simply multiply all of these predictions from our model. In other words, none of the predictions have anything to do with each other from a probabilistic standpoint. right? That's why we're assuming the samples that we're drawing from our model right now, they're independent and they're generated by the same probability distribution. Right? OK, so this is what we're assuming. And now what we would like to do is we would like to go from this abstract notion of please maximize the likelihood that my model matches my observations. I would like to derive a loss function. I would like to figure out how can we go from this function here or from, from this kind of abstract maximum likelihood estimate, how can we go to a loss function that we can then actually optimize uh, in order to find the optimal parameters um, such that um, our model is actually having the right datas, 
in order to match the observations with the highest probability. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we want to simplify this term a little bit here. And the big problem what we're going to have here, well, let's call it a problem for now, but we will find a solution, obviously, um, is this product. This product makes this arg max here kind of nasty to optimize. Like if you're thinking about how you would optimize that, it's not that straightforward. But there's a simple, simple thing what we can do. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to go ahead and just drawing the logarithm here. So, well, it looks strange, right? So what we're doing is we are basically going ahead and saying here we have a product and here we have a sum, but we have a sum of logarithms. And this is the nice thing about the the logarithmic property, um, if we're having log a times b, it's the same as log a plus log b. And you might say, well, okay, that's fair. So if you drew the logarithm here, um, then you could do that. But now you introduce just randomly logarithm in order then to make this product here a sum. But the trick here is that this is the logarithm is a monotonic function. So if we took the logarithm versus not the logarithm, like the, the, the monotony is not violated because we, we, we still have the highest probability of making the right prediction or like to make the right prediction of the respective observations. And because this is a monotonic function, we can very easily just draw the logarithm here and then rewrite this product here as a sum, right? It's nothing complicated. We're just applying this logarithmic property. And the reason why we can draw the logarithm is because this is a monotonic function. And the reason why we want to do that is this simplifies the whole problem quite a bit. Like mathematically speaking, if you're now going back to our linear regression, um, and now what we can do is we can write this as a sum instead of a um, instead of a product. Um, now we can actually look at what distributions um, or what probability distributions can our model have. And this is our second assumption, what we're now making right now is we're saying, well, all of our models that we're doing um, following or all of our observations, what we are, what we are, what we are looking at, um, they all follow, follow a, Gaussian, a Gaussian distribution. So what shape does our probability distribution have? Well, we're assuming it's Gaussian. So assuming this is a normal distribution here, um, we having certain observations, these are our yi's, right? We're having our input features times our model parameters, and we're having um, the variance here, the standard deviation squared. Um, and now what we can do is we can simply uh, pull out the mean here, right? So like here we have zero as our mean, and then we're pulling the mean out. Uh, and we're assuming this is our Gaussian, so it's one over the square root of two pi um, times sigma squared uh, times e uh, to the power of minus one over two sigma squared times yi minus mu squared. And we are assuming that our yi's are drawn from this specific distribution, right? Um, and what we care about right now is we would like to figure out what this term is here in the top. What is the respective probability? Well, um, that's the thing where we can now go ahead and take this assumption. Uh, so what we've done here before, right? We have our, our log likelihood. Um, and now what we can do is we can simply go ahead and take this Gaussian distribution and for this mu, we're just feeding in our xi theta, right? So all we're doing right now is we're simply assuming that our, our predictions, our probabilities here, they're going to follow this Gaussian distribution, right? So all we're doing right now is we're just putting in our xi times theta. We're putting this one into our probabilities right now, now right? So you might say, well, okay, this makes the term pretty complicated. But there's a little bit of an advantage what we just had. Because if we go into our actual optimization problem, we now know we don't have actual probabilities here. We have log probabilities, right? So what we're trying to do here is we're saying arg max over the sum of the log probabilities from our model. So now what we want to do is we want to put this one here back into here. And we're taking the logarithm of this whole Gaussian here. And this is a nice property about the logarithm. Um, that this simplifies the whole problem quite a bit. So the first thing what's going to happen is, uh, so I, all I'm doing here right now is I'm putting this one into here. Uh, this is my first uh, uh, row here. 
the first thing you're going to see is, well, okay, we're taking the logarithm here uh, of this Gaussian. So there's an E function, right? So the logarithm and the E function cancel out. That's why the logarithm is a pretty good choice here. Uh, why we did this actually in the first place. And then the next thing what we can do is, after, so well, first after we uh, did that, um, we will see here we ending up with one constant here at the front. Um, so this one is 2 pi times uh, sigma squared. Uh, but there's no x and no theta in here, so there's no input and no model parameter in here. Uh, the only model parameters are here. Um, and then what we can do is we can just rewrite this whole thing as a matrix, and then this term already becomes a lot simpler, right? So now we have this constant here at the beginning. Uh, that's just a constant. And now here we're having uh, 1 over 2 sigma squared times this uh, well, you guessed it. It's a it's the same formula what we had before, right? It's our linear regression formula, basically. Um, okay, and that's all we have right now, right? Um, so now what we want to do is, if we want to have this log likelihood and we want to have our arg max here, we're ending up with this formula. How can we find the estimate of theta? Well, we've done this already. We're setting. We're looking for uh, a linear least squares problem here, where we're setting the gradient to zero. Uh, then we're ending up with our linear least squares formulation and we're trying to solve that and then we're having our estimate for our maximum uh, likelihood estimate, right? So this is kind of a, a very important thing in machine learning that we can kind of use this logarithm trick um, in order to go from our maximum likelihood estimate um, back to our linear regression and using the same trick to solve it, which is just the linear solve at the end of the day. Okay. Um, there will be a, some details here in the exercise session specifically regarding the math. Um, I hope you could still follow it. If it's a problem, pause the video and go back and have a look at the exercises first before you continue from here. Um, but as a summary, what we have been doing here, um, the maximum likelihood estimator corresponds to the least squares estimate. We've just derived that. Um, however, of course, we have to assume these assumptions, right? We had the assumptions that our samples are drawn independent. Um, and that they actually follow a Gaussian distribution. These were the two things, and they're all the same distribution, of course. Um, but what's important right now, what we have done, is we actually made quite a bit of progress, because now we have had an intro of linear regression, and we had an intro of maximum likelihood. Now, we also have the concept of a loss function. Uh, we have talked a little bit about optimization to obtain the best model for regression, um, and we can do simple predictions right now, like the temperature in a room. Um, but what we haven't talked too much about right now is we haven't talked about our original task. And our original task is this image classification task. Um, and now the question is, can we actually do the same trick here also for classification? Right. Um, so I wanted to reiterate the problem statement here. Um, I know some of the things here are redundant, uh, and I've mentioned it already a little bit between the slides. So the regression versus the classification, the difference here is very obvious. The, 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 the difference is the regression predicts a continuous output like the temperature of a, of a room. Like you have a floating point value, right? Whereas the classification predicts a discrete value, like a label. Um, we can have a binary classifier, like output is either 0 or 1, or we can have a multi-class classification, which is a set of n classes. Right, we're going to have a look at binary classification right now. This is the, the thing that is, well, the next easy thing to look at. Um, we're not going to talk too much about multi-class classification today. Uh, we'll do this in the next lecture. Um, but this one is, I think we want to now go from linear regression to the analog of, well, I guess linear classification would be the main thing, but it's, it's not quite as simple anymore. And we want to talk about why it's not as simple anymore. The whole method that we're going to try to introduce here is called logistic regression. And um, there's a reason why, quote unquote, linear regression doesn't work that well for classification. Um, instead, we have to do something slightly different, and this is what logistic regression is doing. Um, so if we are starting with our linear classifier, what we would love to do is we would love to predict a probability. We would like to make sure which probability is it. Is it this class or is it that class? Now, I mentioned this before, a simple way to approach this is we could just say, well, we do a, a linear regression, 
And if my value is above 0.5, then it's class 1. If it's below 0.5, then it's class 0. Now the problem with that is there's nothing in our linear regression that guarantees us that this value will be between 0 and 1. And this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to simply go ahead and do a linear regression, which is this one here. Um, this linear regression here is doing nothing else. x0 times theta0, x1 times theta1, x2 times theta2, sums it all up. Same thing as before. Right? So we have each feature vector is multiplied with one scalar. Technically, we have, we, have a, uh, we have a bias here at some point, too. It's a little inconsistent. Please forgive me about that. I, but I wanted to make it a little bit easier from a, from a writing perspective. Um, and this is a score function right now. Um, and we want to we wanna just simply feed this output here into a sigmoid. And this sigmoid of x is 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus x. And the property of this function, this function looks like this. So the point is that this function is between 0 and 1. It's never going to be 0. It's, pro it's asymptotically approaching 0, and it's asympt asymptotically approaching 1. Right? And the idea of that is basically that we are, we are squashing the output here between 0 and 1, such that we can interpret it as a probability. Right? And this is kind of convenient when it comes to classification. For instance, if we're having a very high outlier here, like if this linear classifier would predict a very high outlier here, uh, it would simply squash it to 1. If it has a very low outlier, it would simply squash it to 0. And that is, for classification, a very desired property, as we shall see. OK, so what does it mean? Well, um, here, for instance, we have the, pro the way you would write this is, what's the probability of my output being 1 um, for a given input x given my model parameters data, right? That's what we, for instance, care about. Like, what's the probability that this is a 1 here? Um, and a small spoiler alert here, this is basically a one-layer neural network, right? It's not uh, a deep network, um, but it's a one-layer neural network. Um, and this is the reason why we first started with linear regression, and now we're going to logistic regression where we have the sigma in it as well. Um, I don't want to talk too much about neural networks yet, but I obviously uh, wanted to give the hint that later when we go into neural networks and you miss something, go back to this slide here and check out um, how the logistic regression works. Okay, right, so this is logistic regression, so how does it work in practice? Well, now what we would like to do is, we would like to have the output to be a probability. And what we'd like to do is we would like to connect this to our maximum likelihood estimate, what we had done before. So the probability of our output here um, is now defined as follows, right? So what we're doing is um, following our logistic, uh, our maximum likelihood estimator, what we had done before. Um, what is the question? What is the probability that all the labels are going to be predicted one? Like what we care about is everything is going to be predicted one. Um, here we have the product of all of our independent prediction. Um, here we have our model parameters, here we have our inputs, and here we have the output labels equal to 1. Um, and now what we do here is uh, we know that this model here that we have is defined as follows. We know that our model is the prediction of a sigmoid. So this here is nothing else as a prediction of a sigmoid. So y hat i, which is the respective prediction of this one thing here, um, is actually the sigmoid of this linear model here, of x i theta. Again, be careful, I'm simplifying this a little bit. There's also a bias in it in practice, right? So you want to wanna also go to this one. Um, and But now what we can do is, we can actually go ahead and reformulate this, similar as we have done it before, and we can use a Bernoulli trial. So the idea here is that this, this prediction here, um, this phi to the power of z times 1 minus phi to the power of 1 minus z. This is nothing else but a, a model for coins, right? So give me this input, right? What's the respective prediction here? 
z could be either 0 or 1. This is the respective output. In this case, it was 1, but it could be 0 as well. Uh, and now what we know is we can just take this formula here for our model of, of the coin predictions, because this, like again, this is nothing else but rolling a coin over and over and over again, uh, and feeding this one into the model of the coins. Right? So now what we're doing again, go back here. Oops, we're taking this formula here, and we're just putting this one into here. Um, so now y hat is nothing else but the product of the predictions of the sigmoid. All right, this one here, this y hat i is the sigmoid. Um, this is the respective label of our coin predictions. Again, this is the, this is the model what we have used here. Um, and this is the negative part of it, right? So this is 1 minus, again, what the output prediction is going to be, to the power of 1 minus the other label. And this one here, this yi, and 1 minus yi, is respectively the true label. It could be 0 for the first class, or it could be 1 for the second class. OK, uh, so now we're doing the same thing what we have done for our maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, we would like to simplify this uh, formulation of probabilities. Uh, this is our probability of our binary output. And what we would like to do is we would like to reformulate it such that we are obtaining a loss function. So uh, again, to clarify, you might ask, why on earth are we doing this? Well, the whole point is here. We want to go ahead and get from a probability of, of a binary output, we want to go ahead to our loss function. And this is what we're doing right now, right? So now we have this one. We're taking our maximum likelihood estimate. And as we remember, my maximum likely estimate um, is argmax of log p, y from x and theta. And what we'd like to do is we would like to make sure we're getting the maximum likelihood estimate here. Right? So we would like to maximize these probabilities. OK, so now here we have our log of p. Uh, here's our p. Now we're putting this one into here. Uh, that's what's going to happen here. Um, so here's, again, our p. Now we're putting it into this log formulation. Uh, we can do the same trick what we have done before. We have this product here of our independent predictions. Now we have the sum of our log predictions. Um, and then we're simplifying this whole thing a little bit because the log function and the exponential function can be simplified, right? So we can move this y and 1 minus y i. We can move this respectively forward. Um, and um, yeah, and then this is what we're getting here, right? So we have here y i, which is our label, times the log of our y hat i. This is our sigmoid prediction, uh, plus 1 minus y i. Again, this is our label. Uh, times log 1 minus y hat i. Okay, there's one little thing. Um, what kind of is relevant, right? So here's a minus. Where does this minus come from? Well, the point is here, this probability here comes from the log likelihood, uh, from the maximum likelihood estimator. Um, here we would like to maximize the function, whereas here we would like to minimize the loss function, right? We're going here from our uh, prediction of our probabilities, we're going here back to our loss function, right? So we want to derive a loss that maximizes the probabilities, but the loss itself we want to minimize, and this is why we needed this minus here. Okay, um, right, and now what we're doing is, this is, basically our, this is basically our loss function right now. So our loss function here is now dependent on the true labels and the sigmoid predictions. So we have minus uh, open brackets yi times log y hat i plus 1 minus yi times log 1 minus y hat i. Now, what do we know here? Well, what we want to do here is basically we want to see what happens if our label is 1. Like, why does this actually work what we're doing here? So if our ground truth label is 1, that means this term here will be 0, right? So this term cancels out. And our loss will simply be the loss of y hat i in 1 is simply log y i. Um, sorry, there's the minus missing. This minus must be here as well. Um, and then what we can do again, um, we can go ahead and say, well, we can prove that this is true, right? What we want to do is we want to maximize um, the argmax of thetas such that this, max this is the maximum likelihood estimator. 
right? Or to say it differently, uh, we want log y hat to be large since the logarithm is a monotonically increasing function. And because of that, we also want to be y hat i to be large, right? So if this one is large, then this one is, sorry, if this one is large, then this one is large and vice versa. Uh, and the thing that's important here is actually uh, that one is actually the largest value of our model's estimate that it can take. Why? Um, well, we have a sigmoid function. That's the whole point of it, right? Um, and if we're doing it the other way around, we're setting this one to zero, uh, then this one cancels out because this one will be zero, only this one will remain, and then our, um, our loss function will be this one here. Um, apologize for this mistake, there must be a minus here, right? This minus here should be here as well, respectively. Um, okay, now if you're putting these two things together, uh, this is our loss function. We know that it can be summarized like that because we, we just done the differentiation between uh, the minus and, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the zero label case and the one label case. And this is something what's called the binary cross entropy loss. It's called the BCE loss, right? Uh, this is something that we will see very, very many times in this lecture. We will also use the same loss in, um, in neural network land. And we will later also expand it to the multi-class loss, um, which is called softmax. So you will see this also a couple of times. Now, how do we actually define our cost function? Well, now we have to go ahead and sum all of this stuff up here. Um, and in practice, what this means is we take this loss function, we just sum it up uh, everywhere uh, over all the samples. We have n samples. And then um, there's a little one over n here. Technically speaking, if we would be really precise, we would also have had this one over n here in this loss function here as well because that's part of the maximum likelihood estimate, right? So each sample um, is part of a distribution and this distribution is multiplied with the respective probability it appearing as, as part of the entirety of the samples. Um, but I simplified this a little bit because I wanted to make my notation easier. So just take it as um, we're just averaging here over um, the individual loss uh, values from each of the samples. Okay, uh, what we do, well, we're minimizing our cost function. We're minimizing that one. This is our minimization. Um, and again, as a brief reminder, y hat i is sigmoid of xi times theta. Linear part, nonlinear part. Okay, now we're going to see already we have to optimize that, right? So now we have to also again optimize for our theta. Um, and we will already see that this theta here is part of a sigmoid right now, which unfortunately makes this whole problem a little bit more, more, more well, intense to optimize. Uh, so there's no closed form solution anymore. Um, so we need to use an iterative method, how to solve it. And this iterative method is gradient descent. Um, gradient descent, again, we will talk about this a little bit in the exercises. Um, if you don't know it, you should really look it up. This is really critical. A lot of the stuff will be based on gradient descent, what we're doing here. Uh, and this is going to be very, very, very critical. Um, there will be... A little bit of more in the lecture as well. We're going to talk about different solvers. Um, the one thing, what I wanted to mention here at this point though, is that gradient descent is actually, or gradient-based optimization to begin with, is really key to a lot of the machine learning methods. Um, there's also a philosophical question is, does machine learning or does learning-based life in a sense, or like to actually human life, do we learn based on gradients? Um, I don't want to make the connection all the time, but I think this was kind of a remarkable question of how do physical neurons actually optimize? Because they, the assumption was they are similar in a sense. Um, and this is not so clear yet. Um, but what we can tell is that all neural networks are gradient-based. And so far, specific gradient-based optimizations um, have shown really remarkable progress. And that's what we're going to build on. And I think that is like, pretty cool and pretty exciting. So if you're summarizing today's lecture, I think the reason, I mean, I'm really excited about all of this because I think, well, obviously machine learning is really cool. Um, the idea is kind of we're learning from experience, right? So we're giving it more data uh, and we don't have to deal with like can't drafting a lot of stuff anymore, um, but we're learning from experiences. Uh, 
and can then kind of make, well, somewhat intelligent predictions um, and to infer something about the future. And I think this is really useful for a lot of different tasks. Um, it could be very simple tasks. And to be pretty frank, um, a lot of the problems you can actually solve with linear regression. Like linear regression is a really powerful tool that it can apply for many, many problem statements, and they are probably pretty good. So if a linear regressor, well, a linear regressor should always be a good baseline you should try first. So in linear models, for instance, in complex phenomena like weather, so can actually be quite good. Um, and there are certain reasons why that is the case. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, neural networks are always the best choice, but nowadays with a couple of iterations now, um, yeah, we, we have seen the neural networks, we can tweak them quite well as well. And that's really exciting, but I hope as a summary maybe of this lecture, like really take away what machine learning has. Take away that machine learning is always the very same concept. Namely, you're going to go ahead, you take a training data set. From the training data set, you're going to fit a model to it. You're trying to approximate the distribution of a training set, and you hope it's going to channelize to some unseen samples. It's always the same thing. Now, of course, the devil here is in the detail. Like, what's your model? What's your optimizer? What's your data? How do you optimize it well? How do you regularize it? There's going to be a lot of details we have to talk about how to make this work well. And people have struggled with this over the last five or, well, four decades, basically, to get it to work to a reasonable level. And I'm sure there's also going to be new stuff coming up. Um, but the backbone of all of this is, is math and statistics. And that makes it pretty exciting because it's, it's, on one hand, quite theoretical, but it's also very applied and you can actually show um, super, super cool results here. Okay, with that, I'm going to end this lecture. Um, in the next exercise session, we're going to talk about the math recap part two. Uh, I mentioned this already here a couple of times as part of this lecture. If anything is unclear, please ask in the Piazza forum um, or, I mean, both ideally definitely watch um, the math recaps and attend the math recaps. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the first neural networks, we're going to talk about computational graphs, and we're going to expand on what we have learned today. Um, a few references for further reading. Um, generally speaking, maybe I'll start with the bottom here. Uh, channel machine learning. Um, this lecture is not necessarily the focus of machine learning to begin with. Um, but I wanted to still explain the main concepts. We're leaving a lot of other machine learning methods out of the equation. Like, we're not going to talk too much about things like support vector machines or random decision forests. They are also very important, um, but that's not the main focus right now. They're different models. They, they have their own strength. Um, one recommendation is, if you're interested in machine learning, look at this book um, from Chris Bishop. That's a very, very powerful book generally speaking, to learn certain math concepts, also things that I've explained a little bit faster right now in this lecture. Um, in the book, they are explained much better. The other thing, I wanted to talk a little bit about this one, but I, I, I cut it out of the lecture itself, was like how to split training, validation, and test sets, and how to make use of that. There's a concept called cross-validation. I would recommend have a look at this one too, because that helps you to find better hyperparameters. Um, it might not be directly relevant like right away for the linear models, but when you start training your first neural networks, these things are actually quite useful to know because they're actually going to help you to get better results on your methods. All right, with that, uh, we're going to be finished today. Thanks a lot for attending, uh, and I hope to see you for the next lecture. Thanks, everybody, for joining.